So just so that everybody understands how the, the presentation will go, there will be opportunities for interaction and I will be asking questions periodically throughout the presentation. And throughout the presentation, I'm gonna take you through the, the framework of what I normally uh, use when I consult or, or speak or even with the upcoming book and how to connect effectively across cultures. But if you do have any questions, leave them in the, uh, in the chat box and I'll be periodically monitoring them as well. So as promised, the first question that I have for you all is this. Does anybody know what this is? What is cultural competency? And I'll be looking at some of the answers uh, in the chat box to see what you all are thinking. Emotional intelligence is cultural competency. Being able to navigate within different cultures. H, Kevin Lapella and Deepka, thanks for your answers. Can you relate to different cultures effectively? No clue without a Google search. Okay. Uh, the two people that have gotten the answer so far are the, uh, the people that said, uh, it was another one that says understanding culture. People that said navigating between, within different cultures. Okay. That's essentially what, exactly. Being aware of self and, and how to interact with culture sensitively. Uh, exactly. So uh, I see a lot of you, of you have some of the background, but the reason why I have been curious about this question is because for much of my life, I was honestly... Yeah, in, in environments where I was in different cultures. For the first nine years of my life, I, I lived under two military dictatorships. Uh, that guy over there is General Sanya Bacher. He was one of the dictators that reigned during the first nine years of my life. But I was always curious about how to effectively connect across cultures because I'm, you know, um, if, uh, if my slide moves, <laughs> I'm from Nigeria and Nigeria is a country with over 200, you know, 200 million people. But it's a country that is so diverse that it has at least 250 ethnic groups. And many of these groups have been vying for ethnic domination, you know, and so a lot of them had been ingeniously left out of positions of national leadership because of colonialism. And so when, when I was growing up as this kid and I kept seeing cool and counter cool, I just wondered if there was a leader that could actually effectively bring people together, you know, people that didn't know how to communicate effectively across cultures. And I wondered about this for, um, for so long, even until this day, the day that Nigeria would transition into civilian rule. Um, and that was May 29, 1999. I was sitting in the colorful couch of, of our apartment in, in Eric Moore Towers. And I remember watching and, and, and watching my parents and sitting down there wondering if General, uh, General Abdul Samuel Baka heading over power to Abbas and would be able to effectively uh, let us know how to connect across cultures. And this thought pervasively stayed in my mind so much so that I didn't realize when I got the answer because I got the answer about a, a year after that inauguration. Now you can see me there. You can barely see me. I'm the, I'm the, the little kid squat in there. But uh, about a year after the inauguration, my dad's job as a diplomat took me to Burkina Faso. And now I was this skinny Nigerian kid with a thick Nigerian accent in a French speaking country and an American international school going through puberty. And this was a trip we had. And so in, in a place where everybody felt different, I felt different. And I was, you know, looking for ways to connect. As a 10 year old, the last thing you want to do is to stick out for the, the wrong reasons. And I was in a school with 120 plus people, you know, very small school from K to 12. So from kindergarten to 12th grade, 120 people. That means we average about eight people in a classroom. So everybody knew each other. And people would come at me and say, your hair looks weird. Your food smells bad. You're, you're um, you know, you're, you talk very funny. And so as I was in the process of really trying to figure out myself and understand how to effectively connect across cultures, I started to look around to find out what the values and my interests were. And at the time, my favorite sport was soccer or what I used to call football. And uh, the only thing was people around me weren't playing um, soccer. So I extrapolated from that and saw that I like sports and maybe I should find a different sport that other people like. And so when I looked around me, I saw that people were playing basketball. And so I did what every 10 year old would do when he or she wants to learn a new sport. I went to the library. 
I, I went to the library and I checked out all the books in basketball and I found out that there, there were two doctors in basketball. That it was Dr. Naismith who invented the game of basketball. And then there was Dr. J who played for the Sixers. And so I was, I was familiarizing myself with the fundamentals and the, the, the rules of the game. What is a double dribble? Where did it come from? What's the origin? Who are the greats? Once I familiarized myself with that, I decided that I needed to know the current events of the, of the day. And so I picked up all the latest magazines and these were the popular players at the time. And I wanted to make sure I really understood the current uh, lay of the ground. And so, you know, the Allen Iversons, the Vince Carter, who ironically still playing, uh, Chris Weber and, and Kobe with the Afro. And by the time I started to do this, I started to, re I started to really feel confident enough to go up to the best basketball player on campus. His name is Michael Albright, we're still friends today. And I went up to him and I asked him, hey, Michael, I think I know everything there is to know about this game. Do you think you could teach me how to play? And our one-on-ones became two-on-twos, and then three-on-threes, and then four-on-fours, and it became five-on-fives. All of a sudden, it didn't matter where we all came from, right? I had a Taiwanese teammate, I had a Dutch teammate, I had a Cameroonian teammate, an American teammate, I'm Nigerian, and it didn't matter where we all came from, we had a common goal. Our common goal was to win, and in order for us to win, we were leveraging our unique skill sets in order to make sure that it worked for the team. But that simple concept really made me pause and think about how I had my identity crisis, and I came to find a team of people that I didn't think I would get along with to find this common goal. And it really got me down this path of figuring out how to investigate different cultures. I began to reflect on my background as, you know, as someone who came from a dictatorship, transitioned to civilian, and then was thrown into this environment. I began to think about how that could be something that could plague or could factor into rather the bigger picture. And so I started to, to study different cultures. And then the reason why I, I think this is very important is because if you look around us, you know, we, we can see that due to the internet um, and globalization, the world is essentially becoming smaller. But we are, we're at a point where if you don't know how to effectively connect across cultures, it could be the difference between you getting into a college, you having an inclusive team, you making sure your, your, your children feel in a safe enough environment to be themselves, or it could be the a life or death situation when it comes to policy being, uh, policies being made on identities. Essentially, this skill of connecting across cultures is not only a nice to have, I believe it is a necessity for everyone to have at all areas of life, whether you are part of a, a majority group or minority group. And so, that research that I've been taking on for the last 20 plus years led me to the answer to that question that had plagued me. You know, how can you be cultural competent? Who are the type of people that can effectively connect across cultures? And the answer that I found uh, is three pronged, right? The people that know how to effectively connect across cultures, they do three things. They educate, they don't perpetuate. Instead, they communicate. They educate, they don't perpetuate. Instead, they communicate. Now I'm going to dive into, into uh, these, these concepts here. And in, in the education piece, it's going to be very workshoppy. So I'm going to you know, have some moments where I pause for five minutes and have you write out your answers, and then we'll work through them. But the, um, the education piece is, is the first and most foundational uh, piece, obviously. So let me pause for a second to see if there are any questions so far. I see a lot of chats. Uh, I see a lot of chat in the box. Oh, did I emulate my game like Dr. J? Unfortunately, I, I, I didn't. I tried to be more like Iverson. Uh, it worked for a little bit, but uh, uh, I'm not in the NBA now, so <laughs> I must have done something wrong. I, I stopped growing to 6'1", um, which ironically is how tall he is. But um, Okay, I'm dialing it now. Okay, all right, cool. I, questions seem different. Uh, so educate, what exactly is educate? True education to me involves a few things. It involves um, you know, IQ, EQ, and CQ. So IQ is intelligence quotient, EQ is emotional intelligence, and then CQ is cultural intelligence. Essentially, what you're after here is education of self and education of environment. And you want to be able to understand who you are, how people see you, the effects of how people see you, and why it matters, right? So it's, it's this macro and micro approach to, to education. Uh, you know, it, it's a, you know if, if you don't understand how you are and who, what the effects of your actions are, you become this, this um, person that is, is unintentionally creating 
insider and outsider dynamics. So the first way is that you can eventually learn how to do that is to obviously master yourself as Lao Tzu says. And then the second way is to become a great detective like these two, which is master your environments. So let's talk about mastering yourself. It, if you ever want to be, if you ever, ever wondered what it's like to figure out how to become the most self-aware person, I always say it's three pronged. You need to understand your bias, your triggers, and your values, your BTV, your values, your triggers, and your values. But if you don't understand your biases, you're not going to be able to know what you need to work on in order to improve you, the way you see the world. If you don't understand your triggers, you're not going to be able to know how to make yourself the best version of yourself. And if you don't understand your values, you're going to constantly do things against that. So the best way to understand your values I found are these three questions. So you ask yourself this, what have your experiences been? What have you learned from your biases and your stereotypes? And how often do you stray outside of your comfort zone? In order to figure out what your experiences have been, it's pretty simple. And this is where I will need your into your cooperation. I want you all to answer these three questions. Who are your three best friends? And you can see them on the screen. If you can't see them on the screen, please let me know. Um, where are the last three places you've lived in? And who are the last people you've been in relationships with? The point here is to make sure that you're as specific as possible. I want you to tell me, you know, I don't want you to just tell me their names. I want you to tell me why you bond, where you met, what grade, you know, whether it was, if it was a long time ago, um, and how, where do you often, you know, hang out? Last three places, the same thing. Be specific. Is it rural? Is it urban? Is it suburban? Um, is it a different country? Uh, what would you, what adjective would you give the place? Would you say it's hip, it's young, it's old? Uh, <laughs> and, and the same thing with the last people you've been in relationships with, uh, been in relationships with. Now, you can keep that to yourself if you don't want, if you don't feel comfortable disclosing, but it's also important to reflect on these, these particular moments because I really want you to understand where your experiences have been and then we'll discuss. Okay. Benita college, 20 years. Okay. So college. Friends bonded over sports as a kid. Cody met in college, worked together now, and play golf together. Okay. Lived in urban areas. Sister. So I'm seeing a lot of friends and families. Some, okay, college best friend, work friend, best friends I grew up with, army buddies. Definitely seen a pattern here. Um, one I grew up with, second I met a year through my childhood friend, college, best friend, brother, Bol uh, Bolivian friend, so I'm assuming you're Bolivian as well. Tons of South American friends from childhood, went to diverse Catholic school. Okay, Dallas, Houston, Louisiana, my wife, seminary, Miami. Okay, exchange student, brothers from high school. I, I, is anyone noticing any pattern? Oh. Here, the uh, best friends here are, you know, urban, suburban, okay. I always appreciate privately reflect, uh, reflections, uh, Brown. Um, I've always lived in Miami, suburbs. Okay, so um, let's pause from saying answers. Can someone tell me what, what patterns you notice in before I, I, I uh, reveal what I believe I'm seeing here? Shared experiences, brilliant. Any, more, any other? Any other pattern that anyone is noticing? Nobody named, <laughs> that's, that's fine. Nobody has to name names. Uh, many people have family members as best friends, no list of their names. All right, um, what I'm noticing is, is essentially people have best friends or friends that they've known from their environments, right? So some of you have known them from your childhood. Some of you have known them from college. Some of you have known them from work. Essentially, the places that you have been in have defined a lot of what your experiences are, right? So your worldview, a lot of times, whether you know it or not, is being conditioned by the people around you. And so if your friends have been the same people through, through high school, through college, through all that, um, you know, it's not a bad thing or a good thing. There's no good or bad place to that. It just means that you are constantly in that environment and you 
might not have been able to see other um, experiences or you might not have underst uh, understood how other people see the world, right? So if you surround yourself with the same people, which is not good or bad, it just means that, hey, maybe your worldview has been shaped by that. And I, I say this because I believe that we are in a conditioned world and not an intentional world. If you, I wanted you to go down this exercise because when I ask people, when I do this in a larger setting or when I'm consulting and I ask people, hey, this is just a glimpse into telling you why you believe what you believe. And I always ask people, why do you believe what you believe? And a lot of times they say, my parents told me, I learned it from school or you know, someone, my friend, I saw it somewhere from my friend, but not many people reflect on why they believe what they believe. And this exercise here is to really get you thinking about why you think about the world the way you think about the world. Is it something you truly believe or is it something you were told? Have you actually reflected on that? The same sort of thing with when you, the last three places you've lived in, whether you know it or not, your, your, your brain is, is trying to keep you safe and, and it's collecting information to confirm information that you either believe or is going to make you feel um, safe. And our biases start to form at the age of three or four. And every day we have 11 million bits of piece of information coming at us, but our brain can only process 40 of them. And so I, I'm, I'm challenging you all here to condition um, your, your mind, uh, to actually uncondition your mind and make sure that you actually understand why you believe what you believe and look at where you, your gaps may, uh, may exist. And this is for everybody. Being biased doesn't mean that you're racist, sexist, or bigot. That's what makes you human. It just means that if we don't monitor them, it could lead to dangerous situations. So that was the point of that, is, is to, to have you reflect on your current situations. The next thing then is to then think about why or what you've learned from your biases. And I find that there are four reasons. There, the story, there's fear, there's security, and there's avoidance. Now, the story is what I was talking about earlier. It can be based on a religion you have, education, or philosophy that's been passed on to you from your sphere of influence, right? You know, someone, you know, <laughs> someone might say something to you about a particular group of people, and that's just what you've heard. And that's what you believe, okay? Um, it could be fear. Maybe you had a bad experience with one or several people in a certain group, and then that influences sort of experience how you see the world, okay? Um, and it could be security. You know, it's a way for you to feel safe and better by yourself. You know, you stay here. You know, I, in my experience, or this is what I read, that's dangerous. You know, th that's dangerous. So don't do that. And then avoidance a way for you to dodge difficult situations. There, I'm sure there are a group of people here in the audience who probably feel uncomfortable when certain topics come about. You know, whether you feel, it, you could feel ashamed, you could feel guilt, you could feel annoyed. <laughs> you know, you could feel a whole different range of emotions. You could feel it's unnecessary, right? But you just want to avoid the whole thing. And when you keep hearing it, you sort of have this, this, this bias that you're not allowing your, yourself to, to work through those emotions. So real quick, which ones uh, do you feel like inform your biases is it story is it fear is it security or avoidance all four of them <laughs> all of them caps <laughs> all four avoidance story fear fear for sure um can someone share a story of fear um yeah, or actually all of you, if, if, if it's, you know, I can't see your faces, so don't worry, there's a level of anonymous here, but can you share stories beyond um, what they are? So if it's story, what's the story? If it's fear, what, what is the fear? Um, once again, we're creating a safe space of no, um, no judgment. I'm not, no one's going to be mad here um, if you say something. We're actually here to work through a lot of these biases. So the idea is, uh, that's what happens. Story of fear, current Trump immigration fiascos prey upon fear. Okay, okay, are, are you an immigrant, by, by the way? Uh, just, just, um, just so I know. Um, I think we do think bias when we're not sure about, our, about ourselves. That's a very good observation. Um, I, know, I know a woman who was raped and has shaped her view of men, okay? Um, fear of being independent, opinion. Growing up in church and viewing my world through that denomination and religious lens, okay? I was once pulled over in my neighborhood for being Hispanic. I'm an immigrant. Yes, proud. Gotcha, gotcha. Fear of performing a job correctly. Okay. Um, and, I, and I hope that I'm, with an audience this large, I'm, I'm sure that there are leaders seeing this and then there are uh, people who have opportunities to be change makers and, and, and leaders in the communities as well. But these are honestly the fears that are and, and, <laughs> and things that we think about on a daily basis. And as I'm going through my presentation, you, you'll see moments of my issues as well. 
don't hate me. I'm not going to hate you. Don't worry. This is what I want to say. That. I'm half Jewish, never met another Jewish person in high school, never met a black person in real life. And until then, I'm unconsciously biased based on this, but in no way overtly racist or anti-Semitic. I don't hate you. This, uh, this, is, this is the whole point of this. This is the idea. Uh, my point is that everybody should work on this. Although I'm bisexual, I was raised that it was wrong. For a long time, I had a bias against gay people. I learned better, but it made for a tough and torn existence. Amazing. Thank you all, by the way, for being this honest. This is, this is the whole point of what I'm trying to say here. So all these things, as you reflect on your experiences, um, sometimes it's, it's important to understand how to name them and where the source is. And that's why I when my research, I came up with the, these four, story, fear, security, avoidance. A lot of times we don't know what it is. It's a story we tell ourselves. It's fear, it's security, um, it's avoidance. Our world today is defined by a lot of fear and ignorance. And what happens when there's fear and ignorance is that we don't want to extend ourselves to another group. But I'm arguing that we should do, we should do that. Uh, um, so that's why I say, how often have you strayed outside of your comfort zone? I grew up in five countries and four continents by the time I was 18. I had no choice, right? So dad would come home and say, oh, we're moving to Vietnam, or we're moving to Sweden, we're moving to Burkina Faso, uh, we're going back to Nigeria. So I didn't have a choice, but I was always the minor, minority everywhere I went. Even when I came back home, I often wasn't Nigerian enough because then I sounded different. But even though I initially had an identity crisis, what that happened, sorry, excuse me, what that made me uh, become was the minority everywhere I, I, I was. Now, initially it was a tough transition, but it's the greatest education I've had. And so the point of this question here is, um, I'm just asking simply how many of you put yourself in a position where you're the minority on purpose, on a weekly basis. I'm not saying on a monthly basis, on a weekly basis. Do you go to a church if you're a Muslim? Do you go to um, a synagogue if, you, if you're, you're a Christian? Do you go to a women's group if you're a man? Do you go to a men's group if you're a woman? Do you, if you're a different generation, do you hang out with the younger generation? If you're in a marketing team, do you hang out with the tech team? If you're a tech team, do you hang out with the sales team? How many of you do that on, on, a, on a weekly basis where you go in on purpose? You go into a different place where you know you're the minority purpose twice i do for networking uh-huh never weekly on a regular basis not regularly i've done it periodically monthly okay attend for a reason meeting i'm the only american in my job weekly many times awesome i'm an expat so every day <laughs> sadly not that i remember occasionally not weekly as needed i do regularly as part of my job awesome so I hope as I'm asking these questions, you're beginning to see areas of ways that you can work on. So that is the point. That's how you re reflect on education of self when you understand who you are. The value, uh, um, the value piece is really about, it's a simple thing. When I ask people what they value in the world, 90, 99% of the people in the world will tell me, I value honesty, I value cooperation, I value you know, integrity. But then I ask them, how many of you live this values out intentionally? And then you don't get the same answers, right? So I, the, this whole thing is just to get all of you to remember your five values. You don't have to do it. Don't worry. There's no question here. I, want, I always have people list out their five values and know what, they're, what the, the values are and then reflect on them at the beginning of every day because you have to be intentional about your things. And so I find that if you actively, intentionally live out your values, you find that you're not going to be and uh, you're not going to be exclusive because if you do say you value cooperation or you value love or you value honesty, you're going to ask yourself, is your love conditional on who the person looks like? Or is it actually love that you value? And then when you're reflecting on that, you're going to think, well, wow, I only love certain type of people or I don't, I'm not doing what I say I do. And institutions and individuals get into trouble when they stray away from the values. When does a company get into trouble? When did Enron get into trouble? Whatever the mission statement was, they didn't live it out. You know, uh, the Me Too scandal, everything that's happened, that's not originally what they said they are. What's the thing that people always say? You don't know me. It was just a bad moment. That wasn't me. That you should really, really understand who I am. Talk to my best friends. At those moments, you're not living your values. But when you don't live out your values, we get into trouble. And if we don't intentionally do this, we become conditioned to our biases. So... Be very, very mindful of um, those situations where you're not living out your values. All right, and then um, before we go into education of self, I just want to remind you all of the trigger, trigger, trigger points. Understanding your triggers means understanding how 
and why you react to certain things. Maybe there's a word that triggers you. Maybe there's a certain type of person that triggers you. There's a certain environment that triggers you. It's important that you're aware of this so that you can inform people and, and make sure it's, it's a cooperative environment. You can say, hey, look, I don't like when you say this or when these people are around or when this kind of community exists. I find myself getting heated or calming down or shutting down. And communicating that allows you to be able to figure out safe environments for yourself. So it's always important to, to be self-reflecting with that. The next type of education is education of self. These are supposedly two of the fictional greatest detectives of all time. Uh, some of you might think that man is real. So I, I mean, I, I think Gotham is real. I live in Gotham. I'm in New York City. Uh, and uh, <laughs> so, but um, uh, I'm basically trying to say that we need to become better observers of what's going on, essentially. And the best way to do that is I learned this from my dad as a diplomat, is essentially to learn how to collect and gather information, to become an active listener, and to become a part of your community. Learn how to collect and gather information, become an active listener, and become a part of your community. Now that's my dad on the left with the president of Nigeria. And as a diplomat, his job was to go into different environments, collect information, and essentially bring it back to, to the country. So if he got posted out, he, how, does it, how does Nigeria's interest in Vietnam advance our domestic and international um, um, uh, work here. And I, I used to pick up on this because when I was young and we always moved, my dad would have this habit. He would just, he would flip through the newspaper, you know, uh, you know frat, I mean, first of all, he would go through the news station. So we start off with CNN, then BBC, then the local news station. And then we flip through the newspaper. That's when people used to read newspapers, okay? I, <laughs> um, I, I find that we don't do that in, in, with paper anymore, but he would go through it from cover to cover and then he would drop the table and maybe leave it for, leave it for us for uh, crossword puzzles. And then I'd ask him, dad, you know, why do you, why do you do these things? You know, why are you always doing this? This is like clockwork for you. And then he would look at me and he would say, I can tell you, the world is bigger than you. And if you want to succeed in it, you have to understand it. I can tell you. Eh? So the world is bigger than you. If you want to succeed in it, you have to understand it. It's one thing to spend all the time reflecting on who you are. It's another thing to understand the environment you live in, okay? So you've now had information about your biases and why you feel the way you feel. How about you start collecting information on several groups that you might not understand so that you can humanize um, them. A lot of times we dehumanize people whether we don't know it or not. So how can you do that? You start to actively listen. As you're collecting information, you can do that through podcasts, through books, through watching documentaries, to, to, act, to actively asking questions. <laughs> and when you're asking questions, make sure those questions are not leading questions. They're actually, you know, they're actually open-ended questions. So questions to clarify, to show interest, to reflect. Um, don't ask a question where you expect the answer to be something. Like, you know, for example, I could say, well, Yankees are the greatest team of all time, right? You know, that's a leading question. I'm just basically saying Yankees are the greatest team. And if you say anything else, I'm setting you up for you're wrong. You could say, tell me more about why this team is your favorite team. What is the history? How did you come up to love this team? And what happens when you allow people to tell them, tell you stories is that you get an insight into who they are. Someone could tell you, you know, I've always loved the Mets because, you know, when I was a kid, my dad did this. We came um, as immigrants and, you know, the Mets being based in Queens, we was very, it was the most diverse part of New York. And then, you know, we, it just it gave me this sense of family. And then you understand, wow, this person loves family. This person's an immigrant. This person, you know, is close to the family. That's very different than, than you saying, oh, you, Yankees is a great team, right? So figure out how to ask those open-ended questions and also collect and gather information. We have to continuously collect information um, in today's world. And then understand the current events. In different parts of the world right now, many people don't know how the same set of laws affect different sets of people, right? A lot of times you hear people say, well, I don't know, I've never been affected by that. But we need to understand who are elected officials are, and not just every election cycle, but understand that the people that make up our, our, our that make the rules around us, what do they stand for? Who are they? Where do they live? And also the demographics of our, of our neighborhoods. What is going on around us, right? It, we can't act oblivious anymore. The, the, it, it's, a, it's a situation where it's, it, it's, it's very important for how we raise our kids, how we open businesses in new environments, and how we decide who to interact with as customers. We have to have an understanding of people uh, that we uh, interact with and be on the surface level. And so when you do that, that means you become, you know, an active member of your community. What are uh, uh, organizations you can join, you can volunteer, um, and, and how can you make sure that you are embedding yourself into that community? I'm going to 
look through uh, questions here before we, we go into the don't perpetuate, but I'm, I just want to see some of the thoughts that's going on right now. Oh, love the quote from your dad. Great summary of communication tools. Thank you. I think that it's easy, easy to date a lady through Instagram, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> Go to nightclub and approach. We have to dissect that because uh, I want to know what you mean by that. And approach girls to seem unreachable twice per month. Okay. So, okay, this is answering those questions about. Okay. Um, all right. All right. Okay. Cool. So that's the educate. Now, the don't perpetuate piece is, is, is essentially talking about how we don't perpetuate systems of oppression and um uh, you know and, and racism and, and things like that so systems of oppression essentially are things that the world has been <laughs> defined on and so um let me i'll give you a story when i first came to you to the united states i was this uh, 17 year old kid right and i i was this kid with a mostly american accent because i had grown up in different parts of the world and i came here for college and i remember the the predominant argument that i had with people was that I wasn't African American. Everybody thought that I was American. And I would always tell them that I'm Nigerian. They'd be like, no, there's no way you're Nigerian. Wait, you, you, you're African, dude? Your, your English is so good. And I'd be like, what do you mean my English is so good? I'm like, we were calling us by English. But no, you don't understand. Your English is, is, is too good. There's, there's no way you can articulate this way. And then we'll go back and forth, back and forth. And I'll have to explain to them what colonialism was. And now England came. <laughs> a while ago and decided to carve out, you know, Africa with France and Portugal and a lot of other countries. And then because of that, I, I passed on, uh, I def definitely picked on English, but I also grew up in different parts of the world. So my accent then became more ambiguous. And then up in nowhere, this kid came out, he started carrying this ba imaginary baby. And then uh, we didn't know what he was doing. He just said, Nancy Gumnia Bagadi Baba. And that was what he was doing. He was reenacting the, <laughs> the scene in Lion King and essentially informing me about his experience with Africans based on what he had learned about Africans. Now, I initially was mad when I kept hearing this from my teachers, <laughs> my roommates, and my, uh, and my friends because people all of a sudden seemed to think Africa was a country. And I had to explain to them there's 50 countries and it's, it's different pigmentations. It's not just, you know, black people tell me I should be blacker. You know, you should sound different. I should be blowing, I should be sleeping with monkeys. They asked me if I lived in, in the hut, you know, all these things were coming out there. And I started to reflect like, where are people coming up with these stories? But it's from what we were discussing earlier. It's how you educate yourself. But when, what happens when someone in your circle of influence sees that, right? So if, if someone's brother or sister had seen what happened with me, they go on to their friend group, right? Especially if you're young, fantastic stories spread quicker than, you know, true stories. They go, yo, I just met this guy from Africa. He is the real life Lion King. He sleeps with lions and he's Nigerian. And that's a real story. And then that person goes and spreads that. And that becomes a story. And that becomes a story that by the time you become someone that can hire someone, you have this thing in your head that an African is not a, an educated person. And so if a name comes across your screen and you see that name, you think that that means there's a level of barrier of entry that that person is not gonna speak English and so you don't have to deal with that and then you file that away. That's a long way of saying that. And so the best way to understand um, how to stop perpetuation are these three things. You have to understand what identity, privilege, and power dynamics are and then know the consequences of ignorance and fight disinformation. I have to speed through it because we're almost done here. But um, these concepts, identity, privilege, and power dynamics uh, will be explained shortly. Where we go. The thing with identity is we live in a world that likes to place people in identities. I, we just heard of a story of um, um, someone who defined themselves as uh, bisexual. And so person grew up knowing uh, or in fact being told that one was wrong and so felt uh, this bias towards people that were gay. Now the idea of, of, of that is when you sort of give one person only one choice to be <laughs> this identity person, we get into this problem. We have to look at people through a multiple identity lens. We are more than one thing, right? We're more than our age, our gender, our religion, our sexual orientation, our socioeconomic status. But if you start defining someone through an age or through religion or through something, we miss out on the full spectrum of who that person is. And so that concept allows you to start making it easy to perpetuate systems. Now, if you're, in a, if, if you're someone of privilege, now I'm not talking of privilege. I know this is a trigger for many people. I'm not talking of privileges and wealth. I'm talking about the special rights given to you 
uh, because you're from a, from your your particular group of you know you're you're a member of a particular group of people. If you're someone of privilege, you might not even be aware of what being defined by one identity can do in a negative way. We we heard an immigrant story and how you know some of the policies really stoke you know fear in that person. And so if that fear is something you're not accustomed to because you're not an immigrant, that's a privilege you have, right? Because you don't have the privilege of having to think about an extra extra step or something. And so you might not be aware of how something you said or a policy you have has impacted someone with their multiple identities. And because of your privilege and not being aware of that, you can go about your day. And when you hear someone else say something, you think that person is just being lazy. So, <laughs> These are things that we have to understand. And when you think like that, it's because you don't understand the power dynamics. Now, there are different power dynamics in different places. Power dynamics is just the way different people or groups of people interact with each other based on power. Now, it could be, it could be male, female. It could be the CEO versus the, you know, the, the, the you know, entry level. It could be your brother versus sister, you know, your older brother, your older sister. Everywhere, every institution, family, schools, workplaces, there are power dynamics. But understand the power dynamics that exists. It just, it, 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 I'm not saying you should switch the power dynamics. I'm saying you should understand the power dynamics and what that can do. Because a lot of times people and the power dynamics might not be in tune with people that are affected by it. And they might not know when someone's being silent out of respect or out of fear. So it's very important to just be mindful of that, right? And make sure that if you're someone that's in the power, uh, that has the greater power dynamic, you understand that you're going to create opportunities for people to share dialogue. Um, so that's one. So some exercises, I, I can't go through these exercises because we have to speed through here, but uh, I would ask yourself to think about where your identity starts. I'll just say, where, where does your identity start? Everyone reflects on that. I want everybody to do that. And then in, in a group setting, normally when we do that, we always do it as a group as well. Where does, what is the identity, where does your identity start? Where does your company's identity start? Where does the America's identity start? Where does India's identity start? Where does Nigeria's identity? We, so we start going down this level and people usually have different stories and you hear people's identities told in the context of the bigger picture. But this is something that you can practice um, um, at, at home for sure and, or with your friends. And then how often? This is a question that can really um, come with your privilege. I run a masculinity workshop. And so I ask this question often. I say, how many people, people feel safe enough to walk at night after 9 p.m.? And more, <laughs> more often than not, a lot of um, the men raise their hand and the women don't. I mean, what a lot of the men didn't understand initially when I did this workshop is that, you know, after 9 p.m., even though it's not late, essentially, it was like, it's, it's just, sometimes it's when it gets dark in the summer or, you know, after eight, for example, that means that you get hollered at, that means you get followed, that means you feel like you can be harassed, you don't, you, you're not, you don't, you don't want to, you don't, you feel like you have to take Ubers <laughs> because if you, if you walk, it's going to be, you know, constant problems. And the idea of not thinking about being followed, being harassed, or having extra costs, or having your, your, your friends know your, your pin location, that's a privilege that males would have in that dynamic, right? Um, uh, so it, when you ask yourself, how often do you have to think about something? It's really to get to the point of, hey, how often do I have to worry about cops stopping me? How often do I have to worry about people mispronouncing my name? How often do I have to worry about explaining that I speak English? I, you know, ask yourself all these questions until you can't have an answer. And when you do that, you are aware of the degree of uh, privilege that exists. Privileges doesn't mean a good or bad thing. I, I, sometimes I've been annoyed with how the discussion goes about it. No one is, there's no blaming here. I'm not blaming anyone. It's just understanding this idea of, of how privileged you are. I have, I even, I, you can be privileged and oppressed at the same time. I have a male privilege, right, for example. And, and, and I could be, uh, as an immigrant, I could have some things that I have to explain extra, or I could have a passport privilege because I'm not, I don't have an American passport. And so I have to go through several lines all the time when I go to the airport. That happens to me often. But understanding that you can both be privileged and oppressed is a, is a very important concept because it plays into that multiple identity. But if you do have a privilege, that means you can have an opportunity to um, solve a problem. So I want everybody to understand how they can be part of this. Uh, the consequences of this is what we have, what I call the insider outside dynamics, right? So if you look at this poor little sheep here, only once this stands out here. Now in an insider and outsider dynamics, what happens is the insiders are not usually aware of what's going on or the privilege that they have. And so they operate, they feel like the system maximizes the voices and they're like, Hey, you know, I did the same thing you did. I came here and I'm fine. 
and the outsiders sometimes feel like they can't fully express themselves and so they suppress parts of their identity and then when something happens that triggers them they could you know uh, blow up or just retreat further and when you experience someone that is an outsider in that form where they're quiet or, or louder you use that to define them and then it becomes this thing where you know no one wants to to say something because they don't want to lose their jobs and you as an insider feel like oh why aren't you working as hard as i am so it's very important to to understand the importance of safe environments and these are some examples here <laughs> um you know, in Northern Ireland, we, we understand Catholics and Protestants. This was particularly something that was huge when I was, was younger. The Hutus and the Tutsis in Rwanda, former Yugoslavia, Bosnians and Serbs, politics in America, uh, Republicans versus Democrats. The way Americans define football, Patriots versus everybody else, or Cowboys versus everybody else. Gender, male versus female. This could also be middle versus working versus upper class. Okay, so that's one way. And there'll be many more opportunities to answer questions. It's 245, okay? Um, and uh, another way to, that we perpetuate systems is through this disinformation. The story that those people were telling themselves about Africa was based on disinformation, right? It was a story that, that they had heard or they had internalized and turned into something to define a whole group of people. Now, we also saw here in America during the 2016 elections, how there were actual disinformation campaigns on several sides where people would say something that would, you know, basically be fake news or propaganda, and it would be used to tell and perpetuate a certain narrative, essentially to create this echo chamber. And there are so, you know, Google had to shut down over 200 of its sites because of uh, campaigns like this. But also, there were there, there were so many people, the statistics that showed so many people sharing and resharing things based on the headlines alone and not reading the actual contents of that. And when you get into this area of, I just need to have this confirmation bias, I'm just going to share what I share, I'm going to say this, you see that that candidate is this, this candidate is that, we, we become um, uh, the worst fact checkers. And what I'm open here for you to do is to understand that perpetuation only uh, also comes from when you're not being um, a great fact checker. And ways to do that are to, one, pay attention to the URL and the domain. A lot of times these domain names are masked to look like a certain news site. So just simply do a quick check. Oh, is this, is this CNN? Is this Fox? Is this MSNBC? Is this, you know, just check it out. You know, just cross check. Look at the about us section. Do they, if any reputable site that, <laughs> that uh, is providing information should have an about us session, right? And it could tell you why they believe what they believe. Who are the people behind the site to understand that? And then look up quotes in articles and validate them. Just like when you were in school and you had to validate and you had to source, it's the same sort of thing we have to do, right? Just validate these quotes. Anybody can attribute any quote to any person, okay? Um, and you can use sites like snopes.com, factcheck.org, politifact, media, media uh, bias, factcheck.com. These will be sent to you later, so you, can, you don't have to take any notes. But these are sites that basically check for myths and things to uh, perpetuate stories, okay? Then uh, it all comes down to the summary. I want you to all avoid conversations that feel um, intended to hurt each other, essentially. You know, that's how all these stereotypes uh, become really problematic right? People see the world through lenses. And many times you're not aware of the influence you have. You know, everybody wants to be part of a group. And if they see you and they respect you, they respect your opinion. And if your opinion is based on a false story, that's a dangerous thing. Avoid contributing to false stories. Break out of your echo chambers on purpose and create spaces of belonging. You know, create, you know make it known that it's okay, right? You think this, I think this. We may not always agree, but hey, you can be yourself. I don't want you to feel like you can't be yourself, all right? Um, the idea of being yourself and the idea of um, essentially talking to people regardless of their values uh, is the instead communicate section, right? So what I wanna focus here is how it's, we need to say no to silence, how to find mutual purpose, open dialogue, and how to understand the intent impact gap. This man um, once said, our lives begin to end the moment we become silent about things that matter. And so we, this idea of being silent because we're uncomfortable or we, don't, we see something wrong and we don't wanna say something, it can be dangerous. Silence can be violence many times. So I want to encourage people to do, to do something uh, much more. Be uncomfortable and speak up, right? And uh, here's how you can do that. Whenever you find yourself in a situation where you're arguing with someone, you really disagree with someone, it could workplace, a family member. I always ask people to ask themselves this question. Um, and, you know, what do I really want uh, the outcome of this conversation to be? How do I want to comport myself 
as a result of this conversation? What do I want from the other party? And what do I want from the relationship moving forward? You ask yourself these questions, they help you um, center yourself, but then you ask yourself that last question again, I just, I just put there. How will I behave if I really want these things, right? If you want those results that you've asked, you've answered, you will find that you, you'll have to arrest your ego here. You have to stop and pause. And then when you pause your ego, you have more openness. And when you have more openness, more possibilities. A lot of times when two people are in conflict is because they want their way to be the, the standard and the other one wants their way to be the standard. And we're not looking at the bigger picture here. So this is to get you all to look at the bigger picture. Another way is obviously this thing called the yes and. Now, if I don't know how many of you are improv <laughs> lovers, but improv, uh, this is a technique in improv uh, and improv, you know, com comedians and a lot of actors go through this. It's essentially a protocol where a scenario is presented to you and your job is not to belittle it, to negate it. Your job is to just build on it. You accept the scenario and build on it. You can't say, but that, that doesn't make any sense. You just have to build on it. And so that concept of listening to someone and then building on something is, is, is a way for you to get to a conversational approach as opposed to an aggressive approach. You don't have to agree with it, but you can always ask, you can always find what their values are through more questions and saying that. And at the end of, you know, I could give an example, two people like uh, one per there are two people, one person likes Cristiano Ronaldo and another doesn't. Okay. So the person that hates Cristiano Ronaldo says, I hate Cristiano Ronaldo is too selfish. And then the, the person that likes Christian Ronaldo can say, wow, so I, I appreciate that you love, you value selflessness. Um, what, uh, you know, here are some ways that Ronaldo practice selflessness. And then the other person says, yeah, but, you know, I still feel this way. And then you can go back and forth. But that person's tone will be coming down as you go back and forth, where at the end of the conversation, two of you might not agree, but that person has more information on how maybe his thoughts on Cristiano Ronaldo are unfounded and you have more information, but maybe how Ronaldo can be selfish, right? And then both of you then have a decision to make whether you agree uh, or disagree. Um, so it's, it's a very conversational approach as opposed to you suck, you like Cristiano Ronaldo, you're just like everyone else, you're just like him, all right? So that's a different approach. And then um, the, uh, another way is what I call the architecture of communication model. And um, real quick, Architects are some of the most fascinating uh, people. I love studying architecture. I love studying skyscrapers. But the way to come about is because they have to have relationships with contractors and clients. And essentially, a client approaches a, uh, an architect and says, this is what I want. Um, the architect designs that. And then he does research, uh, you know, it does research to see if that design is something that's actually feasible. Is it going to meet the environmental standards? Is it going to meet the, the, the you know, the, the, the law, the law, you know, does the mayor uh, has certain roles and then based on that he adjusts and then he, he or she has to consistently communicate with the uh, contractors as well as the client to tell um, his, him or her what's possible or not. And that's the way communication should be, right? It should be this fluid concept where you hear something, you might have a thought, you research, you adjust if needed, then you consistently communicate to make sure that there is a, there's, everybody is feeling heard and understood. Because the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. And that's a quote from George uh, Bernard Shaw. And um, I, I'm reminded of, um, you know, a quote from the, from my favorite comedian, one of my favorite comedians, Asam Minaj. Trevor Noah is my other favorite comedian. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> he was recounting a story in which his father, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, was really telling him that, um, because Asan had, uh, had a moment where he was just frustrated and said, what's the point? You know, you know I'm, this, I'm Muslim Indian and what's the point of even trying at this point? And then Hassan's father said, you know, Hassan, your, your fear, um, you, you, your fear to, um, your, your courage to do what's right, right? Your courage to do what's right has to be greater than your fear of getting hurt. So Hassan, be brave. Hassan, be brave. Your courage to do what's right has to be greater than your fear of getting hurt. So Hassan, be brave. Hassan, be brave. We're all going to make mistakes in this communicating across cultures. But what's the bigger picture? What's right? How can we learn how to communicate across cultures? How can we make sure that we're not disconnected when we're hardwired to connect? How can we make sure that we are able to create the safe environments to literally save our world despite our values? You know, the cur you know, um, history is made by those who have the courage to act. And so my advice to you all is to really reflect on how you can, you know, um, you know, educate, don't perpetuate, and instead communicate. 
And uh, I, I want to close there by, um, you know, giving you a chance to communicate here, but also uh, talking about um, uh, the, the, the book, essentially. That's exactly what uh, is in the upcoming book, Use Your Difference to Make a Difference. I'm, I'm hoping that there's a framework for all of you to really understand how you can apply this to your families, you can apply this to your workplaces, and then you can uh, apply this to, to any environment that you, you exist because, honestly, we need it. So thank you very much. And I am now open for questions. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was a, a pretty, pretty awesome presentation. I know I learned a lot and loved it. Um, people are saying they're excited for your book. Can't wait to hear it. Incredible presentation. Thank you. Um, we have one question here. Do you have any recommendations in educating female youth 11 to 15 in an after school program? And how do you incorporate these concepts to this age group? Any resources you could share would be helpful. What? Sorry, I didn't hear that question. I was I was reading the question. I just saw, I just saw someone say not or not at all fair, and I was like <gasps> triggered. <laughs> Sorry, and I have a dog barking in the background. Everyone, I do apologize. Um, do you have any recommendations in educating female youth, eleven to fifteen, in an after-school program? How do you incorporate these concepts to this age group? Any resources you could share would be helpful. So I find that with, um, if you look at my story when I was 10 and I found sports, right? I find that whatever your interests are in, in these groups, if it's dance, if it's sports, if it's all that, that can be a good tool to really teach cultural, uh, you know, or, or a collaboration. So if someone's interested in dance, there are several dance groups that could form. You could have uh, an exploration of salsa, of tango, of merengue, of modern dance, of jazz, of hip hop. And the reason why I'm saying all that is because the different sorts of people that hang out, hang around these dance groups. But what happens if you put the same age groups in these different types of, of groups based on a common goal, which is dance, you're going to find um, cultural connection, but also just lifelong bonds that can be found. And the reason why I'm saying lifelong bonds is because when I asked all of you questions about who your best friends are, a lot of you said it was based on shared experiences. And so you want to create more opportunities for those shared experiences. And, 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 and it's, it's by extrapolating the interest and thinking about it in the bigger picture and then partnering up with different organizations. Many organizations would say, I have all these kids. I don't know what to do with them. Let's find something to do on, on a daily basis. Maybe we can create that. So thinking about it from that way is, um, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's something to be good. All right, so we have like two more questions here. Do you see all things as relative? Oh, where is it? Uh, all things as relative to a culture, a people group, be them more moral or behavioral. What becomes a standard, your values or all values? That's, a, that's a, such a tricky question. I feel like, uh, uh, so there, I definitely think that there's some things that are good and bad, like killing someone, for example, is bad. In my, in, my, in my opinion, the thing that I, I, I um, that I consider my value is is this freedom of expression. Right, it's very obvious in my presentation that I'm most people can glean that I'm mostly liberal essentially. But I have conservative friends, and I I don't believe in shutting you know someone down and not allowing someone to to say the words. But I'm still able to say my things, and I think the dangerous part we get to is when we start saying that our way of seeing the world is better than the other way of seeing the world um, in, in terms and, and then make policies based on that, right? So you can think a certain way, but never let someone feel less than human because of how you think. And I think that's a tricky balance, right? So it, it, we had a great example with the, with the, uh, with the person who was, who was bisexual. They basically were saying that gay people were essentially you know, people that, people that you shouldn't be friends with. And that was something that was internalized by the person. And so when we have those type of systems, it becomes dangerous. So I say, find a way to have open dialogue. I think there's way much more to be learned from your values and whether you can even adjust your values than legislating your values as the standard. Um, uh, you know, I think when it comes to standard there, we mostly agree on safety of, of citizens <laughs> and, and we mostly agree on making sure that we don't kill people. Those are, are, are universal in, in those sense. But when it comes to how people think, let's not legislate one way of thinking over another without actually understanding who we're affecting by the law. Awesome. I have two really great questions and then one question on how they can find your book. 
I know someone found it on pre pre order and Amazon. Yeah, pre order. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's on it's an everywhere books are sold. Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, anywhere in, in these stores. But yeah, if you if you go to Amazon.com, you type in "Use Your Difference to Make a Difference." Um, all the pre orders help. <laughs> uh, they, they say it counts for first week sales as well. So um, uh, it, it comes out on Beyonce's birthday. Uh, <laughs> September 4th, so three weeks from today, but pre-orders are widely uh, recommended, so I would appreciate that. And someone asked about the podcast. The podcast is called As Told by Nomads. That's also anywhere podcasts are heard, so just type in As Told by Nomads, and you can get the weekly episodes. All right, awesome. And we have time for two more questions. I have two really great questions here. Based on the work you're doing now through tayoroxon.com, if you were to hire someone tomorrow to spread your message and increase your visibility, what is one quality you would, oh, there it goes, one quality you would look for in a potential candidate? One quality I look for in an intensive, um, hmm, open-mindedness. Yeah, I think, I think the ability to adjust <laughs> is an underrated skill. Uh, in, in anything, because I think I find that when we, we, we are a, a nuanced world that is governed by binary systems and we get into trouble when we start trying to place people into these things. And so if I find someone that, you know, you're, you're firm in your beliefs, uh, but you're also able to be open minded, I think uh, it'd be easier to, to work with that person. Awesome. Maybe when somebody brought in another great question. What can the USA do to embrace in a better way to, um, with different cultures? <laughs> um, so one thing I've noticed is there's no doubt that um, when it comes to entertainment, like or or movies or music, US is definitely you know everybody comes here. Even you know the green card is a big big deal. It's green card lottery. Movies are essentially defined as what we see here and all these things. I just think it would be important for education systems to focus on the other sides of the world as well because. I have found that every time I tell someone I'm, Ni I'm Nigerian, it's not even just in the college setting. People are always surprised that a human can come out <laughs> of, of my continent and, and, and function, essentially. And so I, I just think it's more about um, teaching history in its full context, right? I've talked to a lot of people who think that uh, black history starts from slavery, and I, I always have to tell them that there's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of history <laughs> beyond that. And so, if you teach history in its full context, and you um, have a lot of have a foreign affairs component to to your education system, I think it's going to widen uh, uh, people's perceptions of of the world. And so that that's a, um, a systemic thing. I think that goes from kids to adults. Awesome. So I think that is everything right now. We just uh, um, we have one last question here. Who are your <laughs> heroes in this area? My heroes, well, my, my hero, I've, my, everything that I've done I, is from the late Nelson Mandela, um, biggest inspiration for me and, 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 and Oprah. Uh, those are my, my inspirations as I was 10, 11, 12, trying to figure out. And, you know, if anyone knows the late Nelson Mandela's story, you know, he was fighting for freedom. Um, you know, initially it was, uh, more aggressive in his campaign. He got jailed for 27 years and then he came out and a lot of people expected him to basically retaliate and say, now, okay, you're this war hero, you're this hero, I guess this national hero and an international icon. You're going to like make it this way, right? But he found a way to work through that. And I've always been fascinated by the idea of how even though you've been oppressed against, you can think of the bigger picture and understand how that actually makes the country better. And I think we need to become more macro and bigger, bigger picture thinkers. I think a lot of times we, we too, we're too short-sighted and I think we apply that to climate change, we apply that to racism, we apply that to everything. And we, we don't try to help things that are looming uh, 15 years from now. And I think if we have that mindset of being a bigger picture thinker while also applying micro principles, um, we could be in serious danger. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for such a phenomenal presentation. I hope everyone on today's call um, found some extreme value in this presentation. If you have any more questions, I'm going to be sending out a follow-up email. Yeah. 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 Provide a couple of chapters from his book to, as a sample and then send some links out and some contact details. And then um, a copy of this presentation as well too will be coming out to you guys. 
Oh, and sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but if you have any, anyone ask questions, I'm Ty Roxon on Instagram, on LinkedIn, um, or reach out to me on anywhere. <laughs> and and I'll, I'll be more than happy to answer the questions. And thank you all for, for coming. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.